it all the same. <laughs> Sounds That's interesting. What I yeah, I've got. I'm doing a uh, review of feminism for a margin to center, a feminist theory from margin to center by Bell Hooks right now. That's the next one coming, coming through. Good, excellent. I have to check out your reviews. All right. So uh, it's it's uh, coming up on time here, folks. So I am going to go ahead and uh, looks like. Yeah, looks like, according to uh, YouTube, we are live. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so don't worry, nobody can see your faces yet. But um, uh, let's see. I want to get my uh, get a couple more things set up here. I'm so, coming back. All right, I'm coming back. Up. To, uh, well, so a little looks bit like of we've got there. three folks joining us live so far, and it looks like our uh, um, live. Uh, <coughs> so um, let's see. Uh, I suppose there's no time like the present to get started. So um, I'm going to do my introduction, and then I'm going to switch us over to um, to the screen share so that everyone can. Uh, see everyone's gorgeous faces here. Um, so uh, welcome to part five of our discussion of the German Revolution by Pierre Bruet. Uh, I have with me um, my regular co-hosts with the exception of uh, Izzy the Fox. Unfortunately, she couldn't be with us today, but I'm very pleased to uh, have uh, two uh, guest co-hosts, uh, the radical reviewer, the good boy of the left, and uh, Professor Axel Fair-Schultz from uh, SUNY Potsdam. Um, and I will, without uh, further ado, uh, going to uh, switch over to our screen share here and uh, let my co-hosts introduce themselves. Uh, I can get things started. I am Melody, and this is my uh, channel, A World to Win. I use uh, she, her pronouns. Um, and my YouTube channel is the platform I use to talk about uh, history and political theory from a Marxist perspective. And uh, I think that it's really important for us to be uh, learning the lessons of uh, the German Revolution uh, for our modern uh, context here. So uh, yeah, let's just go around each of us and say names, pronouns, uh, your uh, political affiliation, if you should so choose, and um, why, maybe just a, a quick, uh, quick uh, description of why you think it's important for the modern left to study the German Revolution. Mm, you can go in any order. Um, I can, looking at the, at the stream, I'm at the top, uh, top left, so I can go ahead and get Get the ball rolling. Let's um, just go clockwise then. So Simba, you'll be next. Um, so hello, I am the uh, Radical Reviewer. I am on YouTube and other such social media as Radical Reviewer. I review um, books and stuff mostly, sometimes movies and other things. Uh, I think that it's important to look at things like the German Revolution for the same reason it's important, you know, so many other... Um, Thinkers looked at the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution or the war in Vietnam is like, uh, these are the people that, you know, quote unquote, did it. You know, they were they were pushing the boundaries and, and creating uh, new social relations and stuff. So what were their failures? What kind of groups formed? What were they able to accomplish? Uh, a lot of that is very important to understand, to see where we are now. And also, you know, maybe when we are in those situations, how to uh you know, uh, step off of their uh, achievements and how to avoid their their shortcomings. You know, um, when we are in in similar situations, whether it's uh, you know Occupy or WTO protest or whatever the future uh, you know social uh, challenge will be face us, I guess. And that's me. Mm. Uh, he him pronouns. I forgot. Oh. I forgot what all the questions were. He, him pronouns. <laughs> no, you, you covered all the bases. You're good. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, I'm Young Simba. Uh, my YouTube channel, Young Simba, is 
like kind kind of a uh, a project in looking at primary sources from the Black Panther movement, which is very far departed from what we're talking about here. Uh, but I think that you know it's best to examine everything. Like nothing shouldn't be examined. And uh, it's interesting how um, Germany at the time that we're talking about was one of the uh, more economically forward countries, but politically backward, which I guess is kind of relevant to America today. And they reached a, a level of political organization that we have yet to see on the left. Uh, so, of course, we've got to learn what they did white, right, what they did wrong, and um, take it from there. Um, pronouns, they, them. And, uh, yeah, I'm most familiar with the Marxist tradition. So go ahead, whoever's next. Kyle, it's you. It's me. Hi, my name's Kyle. Uh, I go by Labor Kyle on the Internet. Um, I'm a, a, a grad student of history, um, and uh, my specialty uh, is uh, the uses and depictions of antiquity in 20th century Italy. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking about fascism uh, and monuments and stuff like that. Uh, I just had uh, a paper accepted to a conference, and then the conference canceled. About uh, um, it's a good thing that the conference was canceled. I'm just I'm a I'm a uh, whining uh, for fun on the internet. You know, it's the internet. It's what's funny. <laughs> um, uh, uh, this particular paper was about the the evolution in uh, political parties after the fascist era and the way that political ideology embeds itself within the changes and the discursive evolutions throughout that period and how this is also represented through legislative and political and just in general cultural conflict around pre-existing and new fascist monuments that have been built, like the... Uh, Palazzo della Civilita Italiana, which is in uh, sort of the center of Rome, uh, and correspond like linking that to more like modern, more contemporary uh, sort of monument constructions. In this case, uh, uh, like Mussolini's uh, burial ground, legislative conflicts around that as an anal as a way to analyze uh, modern Italian political parties. So that's the new shit that I'm working on. But uh, other than that, mostly what I write about is early Christianity because um, I'm still finishing my master's. And I'm almost done. And uh, other than that, I have a YouTube channel where I talk about video games and Marxist theory because uh, I'm a uh, capital G gamer, unfortunately. I hate to report. Um, and I also have a Twitch channel. Uh, m most recently, I made a video about uh, um, uh, postmodern theology uh, in Marxism uh, and how this relates to the Squaresoft title Final Fantasy X. Um, and what it can teach us about Marxist ontology, what it, what it can teach us about what it means to be a worker. Um, and I get really arty with stuff because, as you can tell by my glasses and mustache, I'm arty. Um, and so, <laughs> other than that, uh, I like to tweet a lot. And that's it. Uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm an anti-capitalist. I don't know how else. To, uh, that's how I'll describe myself politically. Okay, Professor, I think it's... Up. Yeah, uh, Axel Fairschultz. Uh, I teach at the State University of New York in Potsdam, which is a tiny little town uh, very close to the Canadian border, essentially between Ottawa and Montreal in upstate New York. Uh, my field is modern European history. Uh, especially modern German history. I've uh, written and edited a couple of books, such as uh, Loyal Subversion, East Germany and its Bildungsbürgerlich Marxist Intellectuals, a book that essentially deals with um, public intellectuals in the former German Democratic Republic, former East Germany. And uh, I am actually from uh, former East Germany. I've lived there for the first 19 years of my life until I came to the US in 1989. Then uh, Mario Kessler, a friend from Potsdam, Germany, and I, we have co-edited German Scholars in Exile, published by Lexington Books, uh, which has a couple of um, biographical and intellectual sketches of, um, well, uh, German scholars, leftist scholars uh, in exile. My particular chapter dealt with uh, Jürgen Kuczynski, an East Ger a German Marxist uh, economist. 
Then I've co-edited with Mario Kessler as well, East German Historian Since Unification, a book that deals with what happened to East Germany's historians when East Germany ceased to exist in 1990 and was absorbed into the West German state and all the East German universities were uh, dismantled and fully restructured and uh, largely taken over by West German personnel. And my latest book is uh, volume three of the um, um, uh, collected works of Rosa Luxemburg in English. And I have been the co-editor of that volume together with uh, Peter Hudis and uh, William Peltz, a dear friend who, who passed away a few years ago. And right now I'm working on a biography of Robert Hafemann, one of East Germany's most influential Marxist dissidents. So, um, my pronouns are he and him, and uh, why should we study the German Revolution? Well, why shouldn't we study the German Revolution? It's uh, um, such a pivotal set of events uh, that really uh, changed uh, not just German history, but uh, European and world history. Arguably, if the German Revolution had worked out differently, then uh, we would not have seen the rise of fascism in Germany. We would uh, probably not have seen the triumph of Stalinism in the former Soviet Union. The entire 20th century would have looked fundamentally different. Um, uh, People in the Marxist uh, and uh, socialist and communist traditions often focus, and for good reason, on events in Russia. But uh, Germany is in some ways much more uh, comparable to our situation in so-called advanced uh, formal democracies. Mm -hmm. So uh, lots of things uh, that you know can be learned in terms of um, what kinds of organizational models one should develop in order to lead um, a successful revolution, what kinds of organizational models should be avoided. So uh, there's so many reasons we should look at the German revolution. At the same time, of course, we have to keep in mind uh, we live in a completely different world today, and there are no simplistic lessons. Uh, we have to uh, study uh, these events while keeping in mind how much things have changed as well. And um, as Lenin uh, argued many times, uh, it will not be a, a matter of uh, generalizing. We always have to analyze a concrete situation concretely, meaning um, uh, we can learn how to think uh, from the German Revolution, but uh, uh, today is not uh, 1919 or 1920, so we should be mindful of both some similarities and some fundamental differences as well. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for introducing yourselves. Um, and welcome to everyone in joining us in chat. Uh, Axel, you're actually, I believe, not the only uh, uh, German with us today. Uh, my friend uh, Adin from uh, my local DSA chapter is here, and I believe that he is also uh, German. So uh, he, oh, he, he, he says in the chat, he says, Guten Tag. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. uh, Whoop. good and talk back. <laughs> yes. All right. Um, so for those of you who are just joining us now, welcome. And, uh, j we just, uh, went around and introduced ourselves and, uh, talked about why we think it's important to study the German revolution. Um, and generally how these, uh, um, streams go is we spend about, um, the first half or so of the stream, uh, summarizing the chapters that we read in this book. So this time it was um, chapters uh, 15 through 18 of this book. So um, that I'm showing the names of those chapters up on the screen now so everyone can see them. Um, and uh, since 
Izzy couldn't be with us today. Kyle uh, very uh, graciously offered to cover her chapter. And um, so, uh, yeah, Kyle, are you ready to, to get us uh, started? Fuck yeah, let's do it. All right. I uh, just wanted to say um, before we got rolling here, uh, there's going to be this is very difficult history to understand. There's a lot of stuff going on all at once, and we're going to probably be dropping a lot of names and that kind of thing. If you find something com- confusing, just um, drop your questions in the chat. Um, and we'll try to do our best to answer you. Uh, if you feel really lost and like you're losing context or whatever, um, you can go back and watch our previous streams, which are all saved on my channel. Um, and, you know, like we are all working through this book, not as, uh, you know, uh, professors, well, with the exception of Oxel here. Um, Just one. Uh, Just one professor, but the rest of us are just, you know, ordinary people reading this book and breaking it down on the internet like you would like at a regular study group. So, um, yeah, please, if you if you're feeling lost, don't worry, we probably feel lost, too, and it's totally okay. So um, and if you're um, wanting to read along with us, uh, you can message any of us uh, on Twitter and we will get you a PDF of that book. And so without further ado, I'm going to hand things back to Kyle. Just a moment. There we go. Kyle, it's all you. It's on me. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, I, if, if you haven't been in one of the streams before, and if, if you haven't seen the other ones, uh, the, the book that we're talking about today, it's The German Revolution, 1917 to 1923, by uh, Pierre Brouet. You should show um, it. Oh yeah, it's a fucking honker. It's a door. It's what we call a doorstop in the profession. Um, it's the technical term. Uh, it is a uh, essentially a political history, um, and it combines other elements too. And I'll talk about it a little bit because the all the chapters are there, there's there's sort of a, a similar. Uh, what we would call his methodology. The sort of the the the, the types of investigations that he's doing um the types of events that he's describing and the individuals from within those events um it begins at events leading up to uh the german revolution as you can see it starts in 1917 um and then sort of crashes directly into it and then just kind of takes you through really this uh um riptide of a period to where a lot of stuff is going on, um, and when I say political history, I mean that I mean that he places a particular emphasis on what's going on, specifically in political parties, who were extraordinarily important to everything that was going on within the German Revolution. But it is also just something to keep in mind. Um, the the narratives that he constructs is typically around these sort of little biographies, kind of all strung together, and he uses sort of each chapter. Most of the time, not all the time, sometimes there's a whole bunch of events shoved into one. Like, you know, the chapters are real short and a lot of them can be different. But one thing he does very often is that he kind of takes an event and he makes that sort of like the the like peak of the chapter, like the apex of its narrative. And then <clears throat> uses the individual actors from within that particular situation, be it a conflict between two groups from within uh, the German SPD or the KPD as where we are now in terms of the revolution, the Communist Party of Germany, Um, uh, whether it's between uh, outside groups, um, what have you. Regardless, there's these sort of, he he talks very consistently about individual people. Um, And to that end, today we're set after uh, the events of January 1919, which is appropriate because if I believe I'm correct, the chapter is called the Communist Party after January 1919, which, you know, uh, specific. Um, Basically, uh, where we are right now is that the, 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 the January uprising in 1919 has failed. And also the two of the probably the two most famous historical figures to emerge from this particular conflict, uh, uh, Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, were killed. Um, And so the German KPD is 
uh, again, to use, to use a technical term, fucking scrambling to try and sort of figure out what happens next. Um, as Berlin uh, was uh, essentially like control was seized back in Berlin. And so what uh, Brue does in chapter 15 is he, uh, sorry, I'm getting my notes in front of me. Um, he's, he centers on an event, and in this case, it's the Heidelberg Congress, and I'll get to that. But um, basically, he, he inserts these little intellectual biographies of sort of the key actors in the f- coming conflicts, which will be in the next chapter, which is also my chapter, uh, um, <clears throat> the coming conflicts between uh, the members of the KPD at this time after the assassination of uh, Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. Um, and how really the, pur- the purpose of the chapter, as was the purpose of a lot of these types of chapters for him, is to convey the instability of the, the, the particularities of these events, how there really were sort of structured by both these internal and external conflicts, um, and how it can help sort of insert us into the various motivations um, uh, uh, you know, per- the purpose of the individual actors and the groups of actors within these stories, what historians would call the mentality of these people. It's a whole, you know, field of French history that I think he sort of intersects with a little bit. So to start out, basically, he uses a, Paul, a, a guy named Paul Levy, who's been in the book before. Um, not he, he, His mention was more brief. Um, uh, as essentially the intellectual jumping off point, because he steps into the leadership of the KPD after the events of January 1919. Um, he edited, he edited like the Spartacus letters. He came into the party when the uh, USPD, as we remember, I think from two streams ago, um, mo- uh, merged uh, uh, in to form the KPD. Um, in the first international, the first Congress, not international, the first Congress of the KPD. So he was a part of the the forming of the uh, commun the Communist Party with the uh, with Rosa and Karl and the Spartacus Bund, um, as we know them. So he's been within sort of the central levers um, and the, the the events that have been occurring here for. You know, a, a decent while now, and he came in when he was pretty young. And I believe he also, if I'm, unless I'm mistaken, that he, this is the Paul Levy that served as Rosa Luxemburg's lawyer, at least once, I believe. I know he was an attorney, um, and I believe he represented her. Uh, the uh, the 1914 charge, if I'm not mistaken, the uh, when <laughs> she was uh, charged with, uh, I think, uh, instigating uh, dissent among members of the military. I love Rosa Luxemburg. Um, <clears throat> and so as he steps into leadership, he starts to um, position himself. And th- this, th- th- this is what Brue is describing. He starts to sort of position himself against the events of January 1919. Um, and, and, and in general, he is, yes, I think actually using a, just a critical eye to look back on what happened to essentially try and figure out like w- what the problems were. Uh, uh, and his argument was basically that the, the, the level of spontaneity, um, the, the lack of patience, um, as well, as, uh, essentially his argument to sum it up is that the, the, the foundation of the party made it doomed to start because things were moving too quickly. Um, people were a little too slapdash, um, as well as he starts to sort of as well. And unless I'm mistaken, it's been a while since I've read his stuff, but sort of theoretically position himself um, against sort of like the motivations of the January uprising. And eventually he sort of, he starts to solidify this sort of conflict within the party between uh, what he would call ultra leftists, um, which uh, we'll get into that. That's a big part of the next chapter. Um, uh, uh, These sort of, he sort of pieces together these various oppositional elements within the party that again, I'll get into. Um, that he sees as just sort of fundamentally opposed to the particularities of his program and in some ways. And so that's a conflict that's going to continue to sort of shape things as we move forward um, toward this particular event. And so basically, like Paul Levy, 
important sort of central figure at this point because he's uh, sort of leading the central committee. Um, and basically, he, the, uh, to sum it up, at the end of it, he comes to the conclusion that the, this, the real workers' vanguard, as he said, can't be won based off of how the party has developed thus far from its foundation, which, remember, all, has not been that long. Uh, it's a big book, but it's a it's not a in a lot of events in a short period. And so uh, Bruy moves more into he does another sort of brief biography um, of, of, of of to demonstrate the sort of local support for Levy's or you could call it quote moderate moderated moderated just you know, it's tempered program at least the way that he was positioning it. Um, you know, what, what, uh, uh, to reach out and uh, uh, do electoralism at, at its availability, um, the, these sorts of things. Um, and then for in terms of the third little sort of biographical sketch, he brings in someone that we're more familiar with, Carl Raddick, essentially, to continue to talk about this sort of developing theoretical position um, that was attempting to understand the differences between um honestly what Ashley was talking about earlier uh the the differences between the events of the bolshevik revolution and the german revolution how that particularly when you dig into sort of the, the the level of production the kind of production and sort of the history of that production how at the end of the day you start to see that there are very large significant fundamental differences between what occurred in Russia with the Bolshevik Revolution and what was going on in Germany. And as a result, he uses that to sort of construct, um, you know, the, it, this, the, the argument that, that these things cannot come at this quickly in all cases um, and does so through uh, the release of the pamphlet with the long name, The Development of the World Revolution, and the tactics of the communist parties and the struggle for the dictatorship of the proletariat, which, you know, really rolls off the tongue. Um, but <laughs> basically, uh, uh, Broy continues to take us through sort of his more theoretical assertions, uh, some more precise criticisms um, of, uh, you know, certain elements of the uh, political struggle that was going on at that time. And again, in a particular emphasis on uh, what they what they say are the syndicalist elements, um, which there were syndicalist elements, sure, but they placed a big, uh, they sort of used it as this, the, at least the way that Bure is arguing it, as this sort of catch-all for those who were kind of opposed to their new turn that they were trying to put into the KPD. Um, and so this all sort of runs into, apologies that I'm rambling a little bit, it's the second lo longest chapter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, since I'm doing the other chapter on uh, uh, ultra leftists, he talks about all he devi he sort of veers away and talks about the specificity of these ultra leftists a little bit in this chapter. But then the next chapter is all about ultra leftists, and he goes into other uh, sort of you know tendencies of what uh, of whatever. And so I'll save that, and I'll, I'll just cover that then. But basically, the um. <clears throat> The the KPD needed a second had to have a second Congress to try and figure out what the fuck is going on um, because there was a lot of happening and so that's where this uh, Heidelberg Congress actually sort of comes into play. Uh, basically, what happens is that the uh, the Central Committee, including Levy, um, brings forward a program that. Um, <clears throat> places themselves in opposition to these elements that I was just describing, um, what they call as, uh, what these call, what they call a ultra leftist element. Um, and essentially, uh, yes, I, uh, I don't know if anyone wants to talk about anything. I've just been rambling. Someone interrupt yeah. me. I mean, you can let it breathe a little bit. Um, Raz or Simba or Oxel, do you have any comments you want to make before we, uh, Keep moving here. I think it's a very good summary. Thank you. I wrote it today. <laughs> yeah, no, I thought I thought it was great. 
Thank you very yeah, much. You did much better than I could. <laughs> we got to look, look out for Comrade Izzy. All of this uh, helps me better grasp uh, my chapter since I'm kind of coming into it, you know, somewhat somewhat blind, just starting on chapter 18. Give me some background. Right. No, that's uh, I think really what's interesting about this. Now, I have if, if you know, you know, if we are in a, you know, a fucking, you know, grad colloquium or whatever. And, and when we sit here, OK, let's do strengths and weaknesses of the book. Then, you know, we, we, we could talk about the insufficiencies um, of Bruet. I don't like focusing on that in these particular contexts because we need to take into account the the purpose of what we're doing. Um, and we as a group have discussed this, uh, you know, even before we even started the stream that, you know, the, the point is, is is to be informative and to discuss. Um, so but to, just to put it briefly, I, I think one thing that is a, a good portion of the critical uh, to use a critical eye um, to look at this. Uh, we, we, we could get closer into his sources and we could sort of interrogate, you know, other things. But I, I think when you leverage a critical eye at this chapter, what is actually very, very good about this. I Not in contrast to his other chapters, but this collection of chapters has a stronger, a stronger sort of like central framing and sort of like this is the way I'm constructing my argument. He always has like an argument. A little bit of one, not a huge one, because it's a very it's a big book and he's informing quite a bit, but he's still arguing. Um, but in these chapters, he he gets even closer, I think, to a very effectively saying what's important here is that the German Revolution is something that not only is it's at, at least in the way that we know it, the way that I see it, our contemporary moment. It's very, very low in the popular consciousness or historical consciousness or even historical memory for anyone, you know, who is outside of Germany. And, you know, I don't know about within the context of Germany as well. But I, all I know is that there, there's a portion of popular and historical memory that has pushed it out. So not only do we not know about the German Revolution, but we can't do what Brue is really telling people that they should, is that you can take the communications – and the official party documents that are readily available, at least now, um, and you can use them to insert the German Revolution within a broader early 20th century European context, uh, in even a broader early 20th century European revolutionary context. And so, what what it what it gives us is not just you know information about the German Revolution that's really useful, an important event that involved important people that we've heard of. Like and that we we can see what they did and how they walked and how that how how that how they like actually acted, but even more so, it is about this really extraordinary context that's like the the sort of the, the next move after a sort of like okay I understand history I I may not be like an orthodox like historical materialist in some sort of like, again orthodox I don't know even what I mean by that but in some weird strange way. Like, and still understand that, like, oh, okay, like, the conflicts that were occurring, you know, like, b between the, the, the forces and the mechanisms of uh, industrial production and then the people who were working from within that production, industrial production were not just, like, coming to a head at a whole bunch of different places at the same time, but that production itself was having a huge effect on what ended up actually happening. And it's this very enlightening sort of his modern historical example of the way that economy has a direct effect on the way that individual actors, individual people, human human fucking beings, because, you know, hi history puts, you know, distance between us and people. But instead, what it does is it, like, inserts those people into a broader scheme. Then it inserts that country, that nation or whatever, into a broader series of nations. Then it inserts that revolution into other revolutions and strikes and blah, blah, blah. Anyways. Uh, that's my that, that, that's my big long thing. <laughs> so is that your summary for both of those chapters, or just the first of the two? Just the first. The second one. one's super short. Yeah. So um, yeah. So let's uh, just keep things moving. Uh, Kyle's gonna do uh, chapter uh, sixteen, and then I believe uh, Simba is doing seventeen. Is that right? And then uh, Rads and I are gonna tackle eighteen together. Sounds Take good. it away. I got 17, right? Yeah? Yep. yep. Cool, cool. All right, so chapter 16, as I had mentioned earlier, chapter chapter, uh, 
chapter 16, it moves after the Heidelberg conference um, a little bit. But uh, it really what it's doing is it's it's digging more into the specific elements that were part of this ultra left opposition. So there were several different elements. Um, and again, some of the some of these people are end up being represented by biographical sketches of either someone who like a, like a, you know either a, a, you know a revolutionary or a theorist or what have you. Um, but basically, the the first thing, the the first big subheading in the chapter is uh, the dreaded <laughs> two word thing that we all fear: national Bolshevism. Um, there, there, there was a, there was a, an emerging theoretical currency of nationalism uh, that was uh, um, uh, that that was coming between um, God, what were their names, Wolfheim and uh, Laufenberg, I believe. Um, basically, they were they they were saying that like n as nation became the the nation was becoming proletarian. Ergo, we should sort of like like motion along with those gestures of that revolutionary thing or whatever and people were like fuck you like no no uh it radic according to Brewer, at least i i haven't checked his sources on this radic ascribing the national bolshevism term uh to this particular theory um <clears throat> they participated in the organization of the occupation for about the next year or whatever, you would start to see distance be placed between them and the rest of this sort of opposition. Um, and then just to keep it real brief, after that, the the other opposition is what we would define as a uh, council communism. Um, it's represented by the Dutch theorist whose name I had written down. Anton, Anton Panikuk. Panikuk, thank you, thank you. Melody with the alley-oop. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, we uh, actually have some original sources there for that, for some primary texts that I can get into later. Because uh, as we've discussed in the previous streams, the uh, the so-called uh, the the Dutch left communists, left comms, whatever, mm -hmm. such as Anton Panikok, had a huge influence on kind of the the re more radical currents in um, mm -hmm. in Germany, and uh, we can talk a little bit about that later. Yeah, and, and what's so, and, and like what you're basically, what you're nodding to is that there is sort of these specific uh, oppositions, and this is, and, and what's important, I think, for Brouet's text, what Brouet is investigating is the the particularities of their oppositions to their program, the, the theses of their various theories, um, the active minority theory, um, Essentially, like, you know, sort of leveraging critiques of opportunism uh, that and uh, again, the argument that we've been hearing, the, the, you know, the one that I think is at, at the very least most fair, um, although I'm not taking anybody's side in any of this, obviously, first of all, because it's 2020. Um, <laughs> but that um, uh, taking we need to make heavier considerations between the. Uh, the results of industrial production in one place versus the other and how that could actually affect sort of right. like revolutionary activity. Um, and yeah, so basically it's just, it's a chapter about a developing opposition. However, the opposition itself, you keep, it, it's, it's this onion of conflict, this, <laughs> this book, you it, it's like, here's another group. I will describe that group. Now, by the way, that group was fighting. Here's why. And, and it's just it, essentially you start breaking open these layers of these sort of like political oppositional groups. Yeah. It's something that I personally find very interesting because I like the history of political parties. But uh, I mean, really, that's like that's the chapter. It's as, like 10 pages, I think. Yeah, that was great, Kyle. Like as you if you've been following our streams and if you've been reading along with us, um, you know, this is frequently a very confusing read, not in the least but part because things were actually very confusing for the people mm. in the revolution. And basically, uh, you can, uh, if, if you ever need to uh, to improvise uh, when somebody asks you what the history of the German Revolution is, and you forget where you what you were talking about, you can say something like. 
And then the party split, and it was a giant shit show, and you could be talking <laughs> about literally any part of the revolution. Everyone was mad, and they wrote a bunch of letters, and then they yeah. went into lots a of, of Congress, and they all yelled at each other. Lots of angry, yeah, lots of angry letters and uh, accusations of opportunism and uh, parliamentary cretinism, and uh, nothing we're familiar with today at all, I'm sure. no. no. It's all, I don't know what any of that is. I've never. Yeah. Heard of that. <laughs> so uh, let's keep things moving, though. I think. Uh, it, did, do you f- other folks want to comment before we keep moving here? No, sounds good to me. Yeah, I'm. I'm good. <laughs> um, Axel, anything you want to say? No, let's just move on to the next chapter and then right. see how we can tie them together. All right. Um, so. Simba is going to tackle uh, 17, and then uh, Rads and I will tackle 18, and we'll move into a discussion period. All right, I will do my best. Uh, so, in Chapter 17, the problem of centrism, but not that kind of, not the kind of centrism that we think of usually uh, out here in the West. Uh, but in uh, Chapter 17, Pierre Bruet yeah, Pierre starts Bruet with starts. a question. Uh, which is, uh, why were the German workers, who had plenty of experience since 1918, of the consequences of social democratic policies not attracted towards the KPD, uh, even though they looked positively towards the example of Russia? Uh, So Paul Levi, as well as others, try to kind of like tackle this problem. And um, Bruet largely considers this uh, a problem of like all of the splits that have been happening and, and how disorienting that is along with, uh, you know, the question of legality of the parties and the, and the factions of parties. Um, the Independent uh, Social Democratic Party, which is the USPD, that party was legal, but the KPD was not legal at the time. Um, and the USPD, as, as a result, tripled from the size before the uh, revolution, the November 1918 resolution, to, to March 1919. And um, the USPD also had like a lot of trade union, po- trade union uh, positions and, and influenced specifically, I think, the metal workers union and um, something with linen. linen. Um, but yeah, like the USPD represented the, the interests of, of people who were like high up in union uh, leadership. The communists like did not pose any kind of threat uh, from, from the left. And since November 1918, uh, communists had, had basically, like, ne- nearly no um, union representation, except for, I think, in Chemnitz. Uh, and they, they kind of attempted to make new unions instead of joining or trying to lead the uh, ones that existed. Uh, Levi, uh, Paul Levi, thought that the people were put off by the adventurist elements of the KPD, uh, which he eventually purged, and... Like, nobody came to the KPD after that. Uh, So he thought, okay, if we purge the adventurist elements, it must be, like, the uh, illegal status uh, that was the reason for for low membership in the KPD. Um, At the same time, there was kind of, like, a comeback of the left, like, the left wing of the USPD. um, And that came with a reassertion of, like, the principles of the right wing elements of the uh, USPD resulting in kind of a divided party that took, like, sort of centristy p- positions and had a lot of unresolved contradictions. Uh, the leftward movement started with uh, da- Daumig and M- Müller. I don't know if I'm pronouncing those correctly, but I'm Damig? sure an angry German will... D- Damig? Damig, it- I think. Is that right? Damig. Damig. Damig, okay. The A with the umla is pronounced like a long A, is that right? Yeah, like an A. Oh, okay. Damig. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Damig and uh, Mueller describing what Damig called a system of councils, which was similar to the Soviet model, but wasn't. it wasn't like a dictatorship of the proletariat. It was much more like a con- concession uh, to prevent further radicalization than it was uh, like a, a proper, like what we would think of like a, a Russian-style uh, Soviet system. Um in any case, uh, the resolution of the March Congress was the basis on which the USPD would attempt to reconstruct the international to its pre-1914 foundation. Um, and in September 1919, there was a conference uh, on whether or not to merge the SPD and the KPD. Uh, Hilferding, the famous Marxist econ- economist, uh, 
who was in the USPD. It took the, the position of, of basically the leadership of the time. Uh, I think at this point, it was the party of Hassa. Uh, but around this time, Hassa actually got assassinated. Um, but Hilferding took the position of, of the leadership, uh, which was that the KPD and the SPD should not merge and that they shouldn't join the uh, Third International. Uh, he also thought that the Third International had no better chance of... Uh, no better a chance of surviving than the Soviet Union, uh, which I thought was kind of funny because, uh, you know, the common the common turn, the international didn't. I mean, it survived into like World War II. I think it was 1942 or three. Yeah, it was and then di dissolved and as a concession to the Allies. Yeah, right, right. <clears throat> and uh, you know, the Soviet Union lived well after that. So Hilferding didn't uh, was. <laughs> Uh, Simbo, we're losing your audio. Oh. Uh, am I okay? You're better now, yeah. Better now. Okay. Gotcha. Well, Hilferding wasn't wasn't very optimistic about uh, the the Soviet Union or the Comintern sticking around, um, and he also provided as a reason not to join the Third International uh, that that uh, the Third International would be overrun with with Russian communists and their leadership. Uh, which I guess he wasn't a fan of. Um, and if they did follow Hilferding's line, uh, the USPD would ignore the Third International, but still work with international socialist parties and denounce social chauvinism. Uh, and opponents of this line actually called it the Two and a Half International, which <laughs> I thought was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, Walter Stuckater uh, spoke for the left, commenting on the need for international solidarity with the uh, Bolsheviks, who had a very clear revolutionary line in his mind and both proposals were more or less rejected and uh, a half measure was taken um, that international collaboration was fine and constructing uh, a new international was a good thing just not not the one that existed they want a different new international i guess and um later on it turned out that lenin was wasn't a fan of social chauvinists and centrists like lenin often is uh not a fan of those people, but he was really cool with the Zentralo, which was the KPD's, um, the KPD's like headquarters, and uh, praised the KPD's newspaper. Uh, and then Pierre Bruet talks about, you know, Lenin, Lenin praising that whole thing. But the the point of the chapter is more or less that there were a lot of unresolved con contradictions within uh, the USPD as well as the KPD, um, and nobody wanted to mess with the third international basically that was good summary um rads or axel do you want to comment before we uh, dive into chapter 18. no oh, good summary yeah i think it's a fair summary okay <laughs> rads what about you uh yeah no i i think it was fine i think it was good cool all right, so we're going to move right on into Chapter 18, the Cop Push. Um, so since Bruet's writing style is not terribly accommodating to our presentation format, where we're trying to kind of lay things out in a kind of a temporally linear fashion, I'm going to be quoting from a couple other sources to kind of set up um, Chapter 18. Uh, and then Rads is going to actually um, do that. So um, here, this is from, this is, I'm going to quote at length from Rob Sewell's uh, Germany from counter -revo from revolution to counter revolution. So this is from uh, chapter four. Once the threat of revolution had subsided and the workers counselor workers councils began to dissolve the bourgeois looked for the removal of the Noska, Scheidem, and Ebert government. On the 13th of March 1920, 12,000 troops from the Erhard Brigade and the Baltikum Brigade under General Lutwitz, Lutwitz uh, entered Berlin in order to establish a military dictatorship and declare Wolfgang Kapp, a founder of the Old Fatherland Party, as the new chancellor. So I guess that would be like if uh, David Duke or uh, Richard Spencer was uh, suddenly the military dictator of the U.S. or something. Um, 
Gust- and just as a side note, uh, Gustav Noska was a member of the SPD who was uh, basically, if I'm recalling correctly, the military, like the domestic military minister guy. I can't remember exactly what his title was, but yeah, um, minister of interior with the police under his command. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, the top cop. <laughs> Uh, so Noska, the commander in chief, called upon the uh, Reichswehr, the basically the post World War II army um, or World War One, excuse me, because um, their uh, the size of their military had been drastically limited by the uh, end of the war treaty. Uh, so Reichswehr officers uh, were sent to put down the rebellion, which they refused at, uh, to do. Uh, the head of the army, uh, General Hans von Siegt, uh, simply announced he was going on indefinite leave. <laughs> to save its skin, the government fled from Berlin, to, uh, firstly to Dresden, where a Freikorps uh, general threatened to put the entire cabinet under arrest, and then to Stuttgart. Um as a matter of self-preservation, the SPD, USPD, and trade union leaders appealed to the workers to put down this military putsch and defend the republic. A general strike was called, uh, which was uh, which so paralyzed Berlin that Kopp could not find a single secretary to issue the decree he had issued uh, when he had assumed uh, when he assumed power. In a completely ultra-left fashion, the young KPD issued a statement that the workers should remain neutral as it was a fight between two counter-revolutionary wings. Yeah. (laughs) Jeez. Within 24 hours, the KPD were forced to reverse their position 180 degrees. The German workers were solid in their determination to defeat the military coup, and the communists had no alternative but to participate in the struggle. The coup electrified the whole country. From Berlin, the strike spreads uh, spontaneously through the Ruhr, central Germany, and Bavaria. Such was the counter movement that in nearly uh, every. Uh, uh, every uh, I'm getting uh, some feedback. Getting some feedback. Um, doing my best here. Um, such was the counter movement that in nearly every city and town, the military were driven out by mass demonstrations of workers and the middle class. The sheer scale of the resistance to General Lutwitz was gigantic. In the Ruhr, uh, armed workers began to join forces in a Red Army that put the Reichswehr to flight. They were estimated as 50,000 strong, fully equipped with modern weapons and artillery. They became, for a period, masters of the Ruhr. Workers took action all over. Typically, in uh, Chemnitz, the post office, uh, railway station, and town hall were occupied by armed workers. Uh, The executive council established on the 15th of March was made up of 10 KPD members, 9 SPD, and 1 USPD, and 1 Democrat, and extended its authority over a radius of 50 kilometers. Uh, the spontaneous movement of the masses against the coup was similar uh, to the later actions of the Spanish proletariat in Ju- July of 1936 after Franco's revolt. As in Spain, uh, with the revolutionary leadership, the German workers could have easily taken power, so says Rob Sewell. Um, so as we've been discussing, that's the end of that quote, uh, as we've been discussing, the KPD was for the most part, isolated from the masses and uh, highly, highly confused, uh, despite being, you know, very clever people and very uh, militant activists. They, you know, it's, 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 um, (laughs) the situation was still somewhat impenetrable. So uh, despite their just... Uh, justifiable distrust of the more conservative elements within the USPD, the KPD was uh, very frequently out of step with the revolutionary masses. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, just to wrap things up here, the conservative trade union leader Karl uh, Legin 
made a call to the workers of Germany that sounded more like something that would come out of the KPD or the left wing of the USPD. He said, men and women, the military reaction has raised its head again. They, te they intend to restore absolutism both in st state and in the factories. We are therefore calling on all the workers, office employees, and civil servants to go on strike immediately. All factories must be brought to a standstill. Victory will be on the side of working people. Um, and uh, so Axel, a moment ago, that's uh, he mentioned uh, a people's history of the German Revolution, which is where I dug that quote up from. Uh, and... Uh, I will post links to that so you can get yourself a copy of that if you'd like. The, another really great resource that I've been drawing on to kind of help frame this uh, stream is uh, Chris Harmon's uh, The Lost Revolution, which is uh, a, another title available from Haymarket Books. It's uh, much shorter and much more condensed and a lot less academic than Bruet's book, uh, and as is uh, this book by uh, William Peltz, uh, the late William Peltz, uh, People's History of the German Revolution. So um, with all that framing out of the way, I'm going to hand things over to a uh, radical reviewer, if you are ready, my good dog. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm totally ready. Cool, um, it's all you. So I, I ended up taking like five pages of just qu quotes throughout the chapter to kind of kind of summarize it, but I even just... Uh, condense that down and just want to go through some quick little things that I think are kind of most key to uh, what's um, being talked about. So this is chapter 18, the cap put, putched, put, putched, which is like insurrection, I guess, like in, insurrection. So um, starts off the chapter kind of summarizing what's going on and says, the installation of a Republican regime had not fundamentally changed the structures of Imperial Germany. For the big capitalists, the landed gentry and the generals, it was the last resort, a necessary evil, at least until the workers came to their senses. For the workers, it was, in general, a sad disappointment. Less than a year after the revolution, from which they expected bread, peace, and liberty, bread was dear, liberty was precarious, and peace was imposed by dictate. So, I mean, that kind of, I feel like, summarizes what's going on, right? We have... Uh, um, this uh, this push for extreme change, and in the end, things end up kind of kind of just as bad. So, over the course of the chapter, there is a big general strike. Uh, trains are stopped. Skirmishes are happening all over Germany between soldiers and workers. Um, you know, the uh, water is shut off, gas is shut off, electricity is shut off. Um, Let's see here. Uh, later on in the chapter, it says the majority's social democratic delegates had a vital interest in driving a wedge between the communists and the independents and ending the general strike. So this is like what the uh, the the sort of um, government's focus is. Um, and then there was two quotes here that I thought kind of summed up what the the struggle was between the. Um, there's like a bunch of different people and a bunch of different groups uh, being name dropped in this text in this chapter, which makes it pretty hard to focus if especially if you haven't read the other chapters. But it's really like a lot of uh, information. But the things that I've gleaned, uh, these two kind of quotes without knowing all the names and stuff seem to like really uh, put a fine point on the things that were going on. So uh, later in the chapter, it says the committee of Hagen was formed of majority social democrats, independents, and two communists. Tribel and uh, Carpenter are the two, two communists that are part of this committee. However, their party had just dissolved them because they agreed to open negotiations without being mandated to do so. So it's like these, uh, you know, different uh, uh, groups are forming, alliances are forming, and they're getting dissolved by their own, own members and stuff. Um, uh, later it says, when... Piek returned to Espen. He found a state of extreme confusion. A majority of the members of the Central Council had gone to Munster to negotiate with Severing, and nearly all of them had been arrested by the army on their way. So, um, and then uh, just the, the conclusion of the chapter. 
The mass of the working class electorate had moved for the first time. The ballot showed that the working people were moving sharply away from social democracy, but they were going mainly to the independents, not to the communists. Uh, so it seemed to me from reading this chapter that um, you had this sort of social democratic structure that wasn't really uh, working in the way that people wanted. There's this general strike, but then there's confusion. Multiple different groups are breaking away, skirmishes with the military, skirmishes, you know, disagreements within the groups. And they sort of ended up with something more or less, uh, you know, a different name, but the exact same ineffectuality as what they were fighting against in the beginning. If I have that correct. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much nail <laughs> on the head there. Uh, is that your whole summary? Uh, that's it. Yeah, that's great. No, that's fine. And keep them short and sweet. So we have more time for discussion. So, um, yeah, let's maybe just uh, go around and uh, in no particular order, I guess, and say just kind of initial thoughts and reactions or anything else, any other comments that you want to make. And this is, I'm going to, while we're doing this, I'm going to remind the folks watching in chat that um, this is a great opportunity to um, ask questions and make comments yourself. And uh, if there's something that uh, you're confusing to you that we can try to clarify, we will do our best. Um, so yeah, um, I've already kind of commented saying, um, you know, and I think, uh, Oxel, you touched on this earlier, which is that uh, it's a little bit, it's, you know, and we said something like this in our last stream too. I think I actually said it myself, which is that it's easy for us to kind of fall into the temptation of, oh, well, if I had been there, I would have blah, 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 or why didn't they just blah, 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 right? Because we know what ends up happening. Think again, but sunshine. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Brad yeah. Is, is spot on there. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Peterson. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so it's you know it's a little bit it, we can uh, try to with with hindsight we have a lot of luxury there to be like you know oh well why didn't they just do X Y and Z um, you know or you know oh they would have won if they had just um, you know, if they had only been anarchists or if they had only been more Marxist or, or this or that or the other thing. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's um, always worth keeping in mind. I think uh, Izzy actually made a really interesting point last stream, which is that, uh, you know, in, in uh, kind of terms of military tactics, uh, although it applies to just more general organizational principles, which is that uh, in times of crisis, uh, people tend to kind of default to their lowest regimen of training, which if you have little or no training, that's what you default to. So uh, I think it's a little bit unsurprising in some ways that this... Uh, abortive revolution was as much of a shit show as it was. Um, but yeah, I guess that's, that's what I'll kind of open the discussion with. I guess we can go around in, uh, whatever order you guys want to comment in and we can just, uh, open up the discussion. So yeah, go for it. Well, one, uh, a technical point, if people get uh, confused with all the names, especially the difficult to pronounce German names, and you have a copy of the actual book, there is an appendix with a glossary of names in very short biographical sketches. So I, not everyone uh, who was mentioned is uh, in that list of names, but most of the more and some of the lesser people are mentioned there. So Oh, that's definitely a very helpful resource. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, one thing I wanted to emphasize, often, you know, we think of uh, the German Revolution as in a struggle between uh, the Social Democrats advocating the mainstream Social Democrats, a sort of evolutionary path to socialism, while the communists uh, would advocate a more revolutionary path to socialism. And while that might be on a theoretical plane, uh, sound in actuality uh, the real question was 
can there even be a viable uh, bourgeois democracy? Because the SPD, by uh, opposing to really break with the Aung San regime, breaking with the empire, breaking with uh, the military, breaking with the uh, breaking with what we would call today the deep state of imperial Germany, um, made it next to impossible to uh, create a lasting democracy. And thus, uh, what we see with the cup putsch, what we see uh, with the beer hall putsch in 1923, and later on again and again and again in terms of uh, these right-wing forces, uh, destabilizing and eventually overthrowing the republic. Uh, this is all the result of um, uh, the social democratic leadership having made a deal with uh, the military, where, as they used to say, the emperor went, but the generals remained, the bankers remained, the churches remained, the entire state structure remained, and those forces never reconciled themselves even to a limited uh, bourgeois democracy. So uh, this is not only about a failed socialist revolution, it's about a failed uh, liberal republic as well. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, so I actually just, uh, you mentioned the... Uh, the glossary of names, and I actually thought I would just take this moment to say that I actually have that printed out and put together in its own little um, three-ring binder next to me, because <laughs> um, I knew that we would probably inevitably run into these discussions where there's just like a torrential number of names that, you know, even if you're familiar with the history of the revolution, like it can kind of be hard to keep all the acronyms and people straight. Um, and so I do have that list with me. If folks uh, want me to look up any name while we're having this discussion, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but yeah, so um, I'll uh, hand this hand things back to my other co-hosts here to see if you guys want to, um, you know, where you guys want to take this discussion. I think... I, I, I think that's a really, really important point um, for about 800 million different reasons. But the, what, jump, what jumps out to me in particular is, as always, um, the, the, uh, uh, my, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the imposition of the wide-angle lens that I have a tendency to default to, which is really annoying, but is really fun when you like philosophy. But basically, the, the, the idea that like, there, this, this current, the, the, the construction that resulted of these conflicts that uh, Axel just described um, were characteristic of other sort of forming like uh, liberal states, liberal republics. Um, the I, I, too long didn't read. I, 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 the the first Italian republic jumps to mind. How uh, th th there there was an inability for the for the liberal republic in Italy to sustain itself. Um, and I, I would argue in part because um, it, it represented itself as both a historical rupture as well as historical continuity, um, which, if that sounds familiar, the fascists did that as well. Um, uh, and, and as a result, sort of it, like it, it emerges from the, these various sort of ruptures in the construction of like what the hell is actually going on in this period. But well, the, the level of continuity between the, these particular cases, um, as, as well as some stuff that maybe happened with the left in France as well, if we wanted to interrogate it, but I'm not going to get into that, it, it, is this idea that the, the, the mechanisms of these sort of like political constructions outside of like bourgeois liberal democracy or like liberal, like lowercase r republicanism or what have you, when these start to break down because the, 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 the mechanisms with which they can sustain themselves haven't developed in the way that we know them as, like if we call it late stage capitalism is because of the, it, we live in the post end of history. Someone already decided that it was, that it was the end of history at one point. We know that that's bullshit, but like that's how far removed from like the sort of th these conflicts that were color coloring that particular situation. So I, I guess what, what I yeah. mean by all of this is that there is when, when the f early emerging states in the 19th century, the sort of like the late bloomers 
of like European nationalism finally started to answer this like what does it mean to be German or what does it mean to be Italian question or whatever it, it wasn't there wasn't enough continuity for it to not rupture and what happened was fascism uh, in part because in a big part because you know the, what, what's the what's the best bulwark to fascism well it's the left the left uh, and you know they would suppress the left and as a result that there, there's these sort of like it's not a perfect poly system but you know these sort of corresponding weights. My main point being, if we look past fascism even throughout the 20th century, what we start to see are these sort of contradictions between the fascist ideology and the ideology of bourgeois democracy as fascism falls out of the popular consciousness after these sort of ruptures in the war. And then as fascist parties are, you know, like made illegal and certain images are banned in certain countries or whatever, this ideology diffuses itself and spreads out like within these other various sort of political elements. And the way that it's able to sustain itself is by in the same way that some, certain fascists were able to sort of say come up with financial backing for standing in certain elections or you know a, able to sort of like modernize certain elements of their economy like they were able to figure out how to reconcile their own beliefs with the mechanisms of bourgeois democracy eventually capital eventually neoliberalism in such a way to where maybe they are not the majority like group in these particular political constructions because these are sort of liberal democracies. However, they have these new sort of post-fascist political parties throughout this 20th century have figured out that maybe the most advantageous role for you to continue to assert your ideology is to be a minority power broker from within mm. the dominant political mechanisms. And mm. so again, I, I, I know I jumped, I, I almost jumped a hundred years past what we're doing, but yeah, it's it, still it really, really is, interesting. <laughs> it's very it relevant is, to today. Well, see, that's exact. Well, see, I wish, uh, you know, I mean, I, I wish there hadn't been COVID for a whole bunch of things, but this was going to be such a good conference paper. But <laughs> oh my gosh. the point being that when these, the, 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 the specificity of each of these moments is characterized by not just the inability to achieve a certain kind of revolution, be it through the, the sort of long progression of reformist engagement, be it through a, like a, a disrupting revolutionary moment and the insertion of a dictatorship of the proletariat or socialism in one country or, or, or all the historical examples that we have. What it's also about is how the elements of the liberal democracy, even as they fell out over the next 20 years up to the 1940s during the Second World War, how they too were figuring out how to reconcile them, them, their beliefs, their goals to their contemporary <laughs> moment. And what ended up happening is this sort of advantageous merging of various political elements that sometimes have come into conflict with each other, but most of the time can solidify around a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Hating the certain type of people that you know you don't like and wanting to sort of use the mechanisms of bourgeois democracy in order to keep those people on the margins and for the accumulation of capital. So yeah, yeah. big long thing. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, so I just want to, uh, I'm not going to take up any more room for the moment, uh, but I just wanted to note that, uh, I, I wrote an essay about this on my, uh, blog not too long ago, which is, uh, the term late capitalism that you mentioned that's actually coined by a, uh, a German economist who would later be, uh, I believe would later be part of the Nazi party, uh, Werner Sombart, uh, actually coined that term late capitalism, uh, referring, because he was framing capitalism in terms of like historical epochs, like merchant capital, you know, pre-industrial capital, and then what, you know, Lenin would describe as imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, was what Sombart would describe as um, so-called late capitalism. So despite the fact that... Um, you know, modern theorists, uh, I think Ernest Mandel, the uh, American, uh, or no, not American, he's, I can't remember where he's from. He's a... Belgian. Belgian. 
Belgian, uh, yeah. Belgian Trotskyist uh, economist would uh, also uh, popularize the term in his, um, I think, 1970-something book of that name, Late Capitalism. Um, anyhow, just a, a quick little parenthetical note there that despite the fact that we uh, use this term late capitalism to describe our current epoch, it's actually the, the term itself has a, an interesting um, history and etymology. So um, Simba and Radical Reviewer, do you want to um, jump in and give your uh, th thoughts wherever you think this is going? Um, yeah. So one one thing I'd just like to know is to, to what extent is this sort of sectarianism and infighting like in, inherent to like a leftist worldview? To what extent is there any overcoming it or, or getting around it? I know for like uh, electoral politics reasons, obviously, like, OK, the right has uh, the right wing worldview or whatever is more in line with corporate donors, where like if you have the. um Justice Democrats and the things that they want versus mainstream Democrats, you know, the uh, corporate sponsorship of those ideas is a little more split and some kind of, um, you know, infighting and disagreement can can occur. But looking at this, uh, looking at the German Revolution, as far as like on, on the on the street uh, leftist action goes, the German Revolution has like this um, infighting and disagreements. French Revolution had uh, infighting disagreements. The. Um, you know, the 60s movements, for example, Simba brought up the, the Black Panthers. You have like uh, the United Slaves and the Black Panthers getting into skirmishes prodded by the FBI. But but still like the, these um, differences bringing in, in skirmishes in the um, WTO protests in the 90s. You had people mm -hmm. smashing windows on one side. Meanwhile, other also demonstrators are yelling, you know, nonviolence, you know, stop what you're doing. Are we just destined to... <laughs> for backbiting and infighting like how do we escape this i guess help uh, the the most like uh the quickest way i could i could explain that something like that i mean this is my knee-jerk reaction this isn't any kind of uh you know solid thought about thought but you know uh the whole uh chaos theory thing is like as time goes on uh things become more and more random um the reason for that is that there's one way for anything to be correct, quote unquote, and there's a million ways for it to be wrong. So when you have a group of people who want to change stuff and a group of people who want to either keep things the same or regress to the past, then the people who want to keep things to the same or regress to the past are going to have a much easier time uh, distilling things that they can agree on than people who want it to change because there's a million different ways things could change, but only a few ways that things uh, could could you know stay the same or uh go backwards in time um and yeah no i mean like i i think that uh the kinds of lists that they had were about things that were not reconcilable uh and that a whole lot of people were very very passionate about i mean uh for for every uh person as esteemed as rosa rosa and Lo rosa luxembourg or lenin or like whoever like for every person who uh is as passionate about what they were uh, there are a million other leftists who are passionate about other things that are considered on the left, but had like a, a difference of tactics, you know. Uh, so if you're willing to fight and die for very different things than other people on the left, then, yeah, you're going to have to have like a split at some point, I would figure. Yeah, I uh, totally agree. And I actually want to add to that an idea that you're you're just making me reconnect with. Um, I don't know to what extent you folks have been following the Revolution Z podcast that Michael Albert does, but he had recently did a podcast where he was explaining intersectionalism and explaining it as uh, a bunch of disparate leftists were all on these hills that were willing to die on, but there's not a lot of like bridges between the hills. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's actually some uh, influence of uh, there's and uh, maybe o Oxel, you can maybe talk about this if this is something that you know about, which is that I think there's uh, that kind of fractured idea of uh, um, or conception of struggle is uh, large part influenced by people like um, Ernst Laclau and Chantal Mouffe back in the, the, I guess, the 70s or 80s. I'm not, uh, my 
my uh, history is bad here, but they wrote a, a, a book called Hegemony and Socialist Strategy, which was um, kind of affirmed that, um, uh, in, I guess you maybe call it like interest group struggle as uh, the way forward for the left and that their writing has kind of, even if like you don't necessarily, like it's not like everybody's just like read their book and like adhered to it programmatically but like that's kind of how a lot of social struggles at least in you know kind of the united states at least have uh played out over the last i'd say let's you know put a let's mark somewhere in the 80s like last 30 or 40 years have kind of shake, shaken out like that um but also uh Oxley, your time is limited here so i want to respect that and just uh if you have things that you want to contribute to this discussion or you know kind of prompting questions that you want to pose to us or anything you want to speak for yourself please uh take the mic take the stage it's all you yeah okay <laughs> well since uh, since you mentioned Chantal moved uh, i i want to mention jody dean perhaps i'm reading her latest book right now comrades and uh, I, I would recommend it. She makes the argument uh, that one should distinguish between being a comrade and being an ally. And without, uh, you know, going too much into that book, she makes the case for uh, comradeship uh, and uh, more coherent uh, commitments, more coherent organizational structures. The problem, of course, is to find a way of squaring uh, coherence and focus with uh, uh, with freedom and with uh, self determination, as opposed to uh, it uh, becoming what the KPD eventually became in Germany uh, in the mid and late 1920s. The party uh, grew significantly. It had at the end about 350,000 members. And I think uh, Bouye is perhaps a little too hard uh, and Harman as well on the KPD. I don't think it was just uh, an irrelevant organization. I think it had uh, hundreds of thousands of active members did a great deal in terms of nurturing a, a cultural scene uh, with uh, literary clubs, with theater clubs, with creating um, uh, a, a whole network of uh, 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 socialists, uh, working class people, developing their talents. But unfortunately, it was also a, an increasingly so a deeply Stalinized organization. So um, the problem is uh, to find a way of combining coherence and focus with avoiding uh, the authoritarian um, uh, problems that uh, very much came into focus later on when uh, Ernst Thälmann eventually became the leader of the party and uh, uh, any uh, one who disagreed was marginalized and eventually purged from the party leadership, as well as uh, down down the road from party membership as well. So, um, well, they're, they're just, uh, I mean, there are many things uh, we have to think about in terms of the sectarianism, ultra-leftism, and... Uh, um, the problem of, um, as Levi complained, uh, or Levy complained, uh, Paul Levy, uh, finding uh, ways for uh, the KPD to develop slogans that are intelligible to workers, that reflect their uh, political consciousness, their level of understanding. And uh, as opposed to uh, political slogans, political ideas that uh, might be based on, quote, the right program, but uh, don't really uh, make the connection between uh, the situation here and now and uh, what is possible in the here and now and what should be accomplished down the road. 
So um, again, thinking about uh, some of the dilemmas that the KPD faced during that time period makes me think about the dilemmas we face today in terms of, um, you know, uh, thinking about uh, what it takes to uh, create socialist organizations, uh, Marxist organizations, revolutionary organizations uh, that are appropriate to uh, our circumstances and appropriate to um, uh, the, the level of consciousness that most Americans uh, inhabit at this point. I think this is an extremely important point. I think a lot about um, the the breaks between the the CPGB and the uh, the like the, the historians group. I'm sorry. I, I think I think quite a bit about uh, the, the the breaks in the Communist Party of Great Britain as well. Um, particularly surrounding there, there's a group of historians um, uh, who were mo moving more toward an analysis of culture. And trying to understand the ways in which uh, working class people, in terms of identity, in terms of sort of cultural production and expression, sort of organize themselves. And I don't know if you see that as sort of like the sort of E.P. Thompson sort of post Gramsci turn after the 60s as like part of that like continuity. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah the, some sort of. Uh, Came to wet cultural uh, perspectives with uh, Marxist economic perspectives. I mean, you you saw foreshadowings of that already in 1923 with Lukacs' mm -hmm. work yeah. on history and class consciousness and called yeah. Bush as well. And uh, but uh, so, but that's definitely a very important thing to and also for in terms of practical applications to understand class not only as uh, something that is economically and interest uh, related, but something that is uh, culturally uh, shaped and determined as well. So, and, uh, but um, uh, coming back to uh, the issues of ultra-leftism, uh, sectarianism versus opportunism, and uh, so that there are, um, I mean, again, it's it's very dangerous to draw too close uh, parallels because the situation is so fundamentally different. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, uh, we do have uh, a massive return of right-wing authoritarianism. We uh, could very easily enter into another major um, uh, depression as far as the capitalist system mm -hmm. is concerned. And now we have uh, the climate crisis. Uh, so uh, the 1920s uh, was a period of uh, global meltdown, and we are in a period of global meltdown. So um, I mean, you know, the, the sense of urgency is the same. And uh, what I very much like about uh, Pouillet's approach is. Uh, that he is um, very much um, committed to uh, really questioning and changing the status quo. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure whether anyone had a chance to read Eric Weitz's introduction to the book. Uh, Weitz is a um, uh, leftist historian. He's very sympathetic to Poirier, but uh, in the introduction, I think it was written in 2006, mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, you know, hardly anyone shares Poirier's uh, commitment to socialist transformation yeah. any longer. Of course, things have changed a little yeah. bit since 2006, but I think uh, that really uh, illustrates uh, the big difference between mainstream academics, even mainstream uh, left-wing and left-liberal academics and uh, revolutionaries who, who see that what we need to do has to go far beyond tweaking a few things. We yeah. are in a real crisis and, and uh, what this older generation thought was solved uh, really has not been solved. It has only been temporarily glazed over. 
the integration of the working class into capitalism, a kind of, quote, civilizing capitalism. We now know all of that uh, is, uh, is really falling apart. So, uh, um, Bouillet's book from 1971 feels very contemporary in that sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, that's, these are all really great areas of conversation. And I just wanted to bring up that we keep talking about this kind of this uh, dichotomy of like ultra leftism and kind of the sclerotic bureau bureaucratism of the SPD, especially. Um, and I think there's somewhere Lenin makes this point over and over again and throughout his writings, but basically like ultra leftism is the uh, punishment for the sins of opportunism, I think is, <laughs> he says something to that effect. He says this uh, frequently throughout his, his work and his uh, assessments of both uh, the Russian situation during the course of the Russian revolution and of his assessments of the, um, the German situation. And it's, uh, by the way, for those of you Very listening clear. in, if you are not aware, this is the uh, context in which um, Lenin writes uh, left-wing communism and infantile disorder and, uh, for example, proclaims his opposition to the split between the uh, KPD, the Communist Party, and the ultra-lefts within it who went off to form the KAPD, the uh, Communist Workers' Party, um, so he expressed his uh, concerns to, uh, that that was that split was uh, imprudent at, to say the least, um, and uh, that's a really important document that we can talk about either uh, today or in for future streams, whatever folks are um, wanting to do. So uh, yeah, let's uh, let's keep things moving. Uh, are there any uh, rads or uh, Simba? Do you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I hate to bring the conversation, uh, backward, but, um, to, to comment on, um, what Radical Reviewer said about Michael Albert's, uh, or, or the idea of what Michael Albert was talking about, um, yeah, intersectionality, like, does, um, come with, or at least intersectionality at our point in history, especially on social media, comes with uh, a whole lot of uh, disagreements between people. And, you know, a lot of them are baseless, but some of them are well-founded. Um, and yeah, it's difficult to like bridge those gaps. Uh, and there is like a, a tendency for, for folks on the left and movements on the left to like kind of split up. Uh, we can, we can even see that with, um, with Black Lives Matter, there's like a really, a very small like anti-capitalist uh, group, like radically anti-capitalist uh, group of those folks and people who don't don't like the whole Black Lives Matter thing, and then those who are uh, perfectly fine with with uh, pushing the whole Black excellence narrative of like, oh well, if you try hard enough, you can be like a billionaire, and then we'll have like a whole bunch of Black-owned businesses, etc. Uh, which I'm not going to sit here and, and criticize either of those two uh, groups specifically. Uh, but if you look at, you know, Russia at the at the same time as what's going on at the German uh, during the German Revolution, like it's it's a very unified, uh, very like uh, y you know like like actually you know what. How about 10 years after these events, you know, uh, after Stalin takes takes charge and he's like in the I, I think what did he get promoted to general secretary, general oh, secretary. Yeah. yeah, he's general secretary of the Soviet Union. And we have like all of the um, they have all of the like military marches and stuff. And it's like all very unified and everybody has like the same idea of what's going on. And and that's also a left wing movement. So, there, I mean, there has to be like. I'm not sure if it's like a part of Western ideology that that makes uh, the left in the West like very uh, compartmentalized and uh, prone to splitting up and stuff. Um, but but there is something about maybe Marxism, Leninism or something that that like keeps people together. 
I don't know if it's authoritarianism, but but uh, yeah, there have been very successful left wing movements that are very very unified to the point that it's almost scary. <laughs> and I I'm not sure what what instigates that. Yeah, it's not something that I would have the the wherewithal to really uh, comment on at, at this juncture, but um, sure. Yeah. Um, oh, also, if we could like uh if we could just like take five seconds to define what opportunism and ultra leftism are in clear terms because i you know you hear those words thrown around a whole bunch and they refer to a whole lot of different events in yeah, history and they can definitely like they can refer to different um things in different contexts so it's always good to clarify and if you go back and watch our previous streams we are we keep doing this we keep coming back and uh, and sometimes we even repeat definitions that we do in, in, in previous streams just to you know keep everyone up to date because we do these live and we don't necessarily know that everyone who's joining us every time is the same people. Um, so it's a good idea to, to always be refining our definitions and talking about them. So let's get into what opportunism is in this context. So opportunism is like in this context is really referring to um the kind of careerism of the um very like parliamentary i guess approach to socialist politics that was predominant in the uh spd uh had become the the predominant um so uh opportunism in the sense that uh you know using the party as a means of like basically so like means of like accumulating social capital basically like getting clout <laughs> uh and uh you know in kind of in ingraining yourself in the structures of bourgeois um society but like with wearing a socialist party badge while you do it basically um, that's more or less what opportunism means in this context. And then, so ultra leftism then is kind of the diametric response to that. It's to say, okay, well, party organization is sclerotic and conservative, so we're just going to be spontaneous and, uh, and wild and, and free and ain't, ain't no party boss going to stop me. Um, so, <laughs> Um, it's kind of, but it can, it has, uh, as we've been exploring here in our study of the German revolution, it has its downsides. It can lead to kind of, uh, adventurism and kind of not at being kind of isolated from the masses. Like, yes, you're very left wing over there, but nobody else is following you and you're kind of, you know, uh, <laughs> getting crushed probably so there's uh that's the best um yeah that's probably the best definition i can give of those two terms if anybody else wants to jump in and fill in any gaps that i left <laughs> sure i i first want to apologize that i was reminded i've forgotten both of them now because i have weapon weapons grade adhd but i was reminded of two sections that i apparently skipped over in my outline one of them being the definition of ultra leftism. Uh, I apparently skipped over that because I wrote it out specifically to share it, and then didn't even fucking say it. But anyways, I think that's I think that's good, um, and that in general, that the most important thing to remember when it comes to ultra leftism is that while we can absolutely construct an appropriate definition of a particular current or a tendency of ultra leftism, that it's usually used almost always as a pejorative term. So basically, it's a term that's used to characterize someone in a poor way. So it's a, it's a, the term itself is critique, which it, sound, it even sounds like it, right? Ultra leftism. But in, in that, exactly as Melody was saying, that the thing about ultra leftism is that it's not about any one particular ultra left current, but that it is something that it's a, it's a, it's a term, it's a term that is, uh, fluid based off of the person who's able to use it and that it has changed and been recontextualized across various different um, sort of sub-tendencies of the European left, including council communism, euro communism, 
anarcho syndicalism, uh, a whole bunch of different tendencies that, in general, th- that usually are characterized by a principled, at least in the people who are defining them as ultra leftists. The idea is that it's a principled opposition to a more concrete plan. I think is. I, at least the way that I would conceptualize it is a lot of the critique of ultra leftism is that you have principle, but you don't have sort of these concrete, like Mel was talking about with spontaneity um, and that sort of that that would be sort of that could fall under this sort of like like more general critique of the sort of pr- principled ideals um, of a particular sort of, you know, ultra leftist tendency versus something that's a little more concrete and, as they say, scientific, would yeah. say, um, just Leninist. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, Lenin very explicitly talks about this in uh, What is to be Done way back in 1902, where uh, the uh, so called bowing to spontaneity is kind of the sin of both the uh, conservative. Uh, parliamentary, uh, parliamentarian sort of Menshevik outlook that, oh, we can reform our way out of capitalism or, yeah, you know, we have to have, we have to go through bourgeois revolution and bourgeois democracy first. Um, and then on the other side, kind of the, I, I guess, more anarchistic or uh, in, propaganda of the deed. Yeah. yeah. In the c- Russian context, the kind of the popular form of uh, rebellion uh, was uh, narodism, which is translates roughly to populism. It was kind of the the heart of the peasant movement and uh, the idea of uh, the in Russian the word terror, which translates as terrorism or terror, but like really specifically refers to like individual assassinations. Like we're gonna kill the czar, and that's gonna spark a revolution. Like Lenin basically critiques this as like these are two sides of the same coin of bowing to spontaneity like they both kind of assume that the masses don't need any kind of guiding force or agency like a party which is the case that he makes and what is to be done is that we need a revolutionary party to um to guide us to revolution um and if you agree with the leninist position that's tends to be you know in our current context in some form or another that tends to be what folks are arguing for is to constitute to constitute an you know an independent revolutionary organization um whether you want to call that a, a party or or something else um you know we dealing with different very different historical circumstances obviously but um yeah rads we haven't heard from you in a bit do you want to comment here um, yeah, just listening to what people are saying, I'm kind of thinking of what would maybe be a um, pop politics uh, spin on looking at this ultra leftism. And I was thinking if you folks are familiar with the um, folk singer David David Rovick, he does that song oh, "I'm a Better Anarchist Than You," which Dave is Rovick. Like, yeah, he's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's but hilarious. he has this song "I'm a Better Anarchist Than You" that's kind of poking fun at the uh, the um, dumpster diving you know vegan goes to every single black block event sort of um anarchist and like you can maybe say to what extent you know uh people who are uh you know like that you know how effective are are they or, or whatever but I, I i think it seems a little petty almost or something and i'm reminded of um jello biafra the singer of the dead kennedys does a bunch of spoken word uh, stuff and he often talks about the the more hardcore than thou the people that are like more squat they they squat buildings and they go to all the events and they break windows and they're like the best anarchists out there and stuff um but i don't i don't know it just it, it reminds me also i guess of like a uh even more contemporary bernie bros or bernie or busters or something that um uh a, a little petty i guess to look to the 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 furthest uh ideological ideologically uh you know solid in in one direction folks among us and uh paternalistically you know oh you i don't know you know what i'm saying (laughs) 
And of course, there's a serious way of using these terms, and you can use them to just uh, dismiss opponents, right, by saying you are, um, you know, a sectarian or a, a ultra leftist, or you're an opportunist, and uh, uh, they have been used and abused uh, in uh, the working class movement. Still are, can't confirm. You hear it every once in a while. Also, Rad, I've heard, I've been to a Henry Rollins spoken word thing, and he had a very similar rant, and it was fucking sick. <laughs> it was awesome. I mean, the, I think there's obviously like a couple ways to, to look at it, right? I mean, if someone is very much like, well, why would you ever engage in this or this or this? That's just reformism. Like what we need is revolution. Don't bother with uh, whatever. I don't know, voting or something. Well, and I don't know, maybe there's a lot of reforms that I would support raising a minimum wage, putting an end to a war, you know, uh, fixing yeah. our our uh, the way that we handle uh, border security and, and stuff. You know, these reforms. I think would mean a lot to a great deal of people and to say that's like reformism or whatever yeah. and you know we need to focus on revolution yeah. Yeah. is a problem but I think to also turn around and paternalistically you know wave away like oh well if you you know don't go get behind blue you know no matter who and you keep that's saying Bernie even though he's not going to win just you know away with you you're being unrealistic shoo mm -hmm. um, yeah. for a problem. You're, com you're, com you're completely right and it's because it's all it, it, they're constructed from positions of defeat these arguments and they're not interrogating one another and 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 i could go on it, it, the, the yeah. point is that it's it's not enough you have to as you just did very briefly read it, it took him about five seconds to leverage the critique for like if we're talking about this particular rupture between left-wing current say an electoral current and an like a, a, a one that's positioned itself explicitly against electoral currency or electoral politics. Well, the, the really the the one job that we have past figuring out what the fuck to do next is to appropriately interrogate those discourses and to do so in such a way that's not looking toward destroying the other discourse, but at, but as a means for confronting that which is not sufficient without critique. This is where dialectics was not just he Hegel didn't invent dialectics. Yeah. <laughs> dialectics have been around. It, it is a mo di the the mode in which like Platonian philosophy was written was in dialogue and in such a way to uh, under the like presupposing the idea that one argument is not enough and that one needs to if you really wish to strengthen your argument you need to appropriately leverage critique at that argument and to do so from within understood and firmly conceptualized positions like with the example of plato in terms of like other philosophical tendencies that have like that are incorporated within you know written work by other people who are doing stuff and writing stuff and talking about it now that's not the that that's you know that's that that's you know you know snooty philosophers snooty just philosophy. talking to each other but at the same time it's a really important point which is that the comfort with which we seek a form of dialectical politics is not dialectical politics but instead a means for soothing the anxieties of our contemporary moment as we find ourselves within the context of an empire that's not defined by the early 20th century, but it's more defined by the ways in which Antonio Negri defines it, which is something that has become so infused and embedded in sort of dispersed within our context that it starts to, like as we've been revitalizing, you know, Frederick Jameson or Zizek, depending on who you ask, thesis, over the past, you know, 10, 15 years since Mark Fisher started doing it, is how is our capacity for imagination for not just the things that we know, but the mode in which we le we live had so much distance put between us that our even our solutions, be them quote unquote ultra leftist, be them quote unquote, you know, you know, soak them, you know, revisionist, you know, BS crap or whatever you like. Be them whichever critique you're leveraging from either position. The only effective way to truly like move forward and beyond this is to take the sum total of that which we can understand is our current situation, which to me involves this idea of like mm -hmm. like an empire that reaches up in and like out of us 
in so many instances that has so like seeped into the, like the general both cultural and social even phenomenological the the conscious context of the world that we live in so that's all just to mm -hmm. say real critique is real fucking critique sometimes it's hard sometimes it's uncomfortable sometimes it doesn't make sense right away but most of the time what ends up happening is you use the good faith critique that's leveraged by a party who is also using investigative means, using a frame of reference that is trying to see things for as they are and not out as I've conceptualized them. Mm -hmm. And that we're looking outside of ourselves and trying to essentially reconcile our subjectivity with that which is actually fucking happening. Yeah. And what that takes is just critique, interrogate my beliefs about leftist tendency, interrogate right. my beliefs about workerism or autonomism or communism or anarcho-syndicalism or any other tendency of that, and to do so in a way that is seeking to actually rupture something yeah. and not to just forward continuity. End of rant. I'm sorry. Oh, I, I stepped on that soapbox again. Oh, that's on okay. That's what, I'm so that's, sorry. It was an accident. That's what I have these streams for, is so that I can uh, have guests on and you guys can have yeah. your soapbox. Uh, I, uh, you know, this is actually what you bring up there is uh, very pertinent because, you know, and somebody, Atomic Source in the chat, basically just reflected on that, which is that, you know, we, all of, all of us here come from, you know, different tendencies of the left and we're having an adult conversation, right? Like we're studying our common history as, you know, presumably revolutionary leftists of some stripe or another. Um, and that's, that's what I try to facilitate here. And this is what I try to facilitate on my channel. I have my, obviously my Marxist inclinations that are very strong, but I work with and am in contact with, you know, anarchists and other sorts of uh, other designations of leftists and in, in real, you know, my real life and my real activism, because we live in the real fucking world and we don't live in, uh, I guess, what I was going to say about ultra leftism is if you want, if you want like the most concise illustrative example of ultra leftism, you just go on left Twitter and look at all the fucking like posturing and empty phraseology. And I'm, you know, I'm woker than thou, or I'm, you know, more radical than thou kind of posturing that goes on, on Twitter or social media or whatever, which is, you know, I mean, there's an extent to which that permeates our actual movements too, but it, it's, I think, a lot more like accelerated on the online space where mm. like it's a capitalist medium and it's encouraging us to have these kind of chest beating conflicts because that's how they make money, right? Twitter makes money by keeping people's eyeballs on it and keeping, you know, everyone, um, you know, engaged, right? So that means, because that means more ad revenue, right? And so I think that it forces us into, and this is why I'm, I'm very careful with my, with my platform online, is that, you know, it, it encourages a kind of thinking, which is, um, you know, well, everyone's got to have a hot take, like, mm -hmm. we've all got to have, you know, we got to each kind of out edge lord the, each other to be you know to stay in the spotlight and that does not that is not at all conducive to the kinds of conversations that we are needing to have as comrades in struggle well, the ones that i actually have yeah it's like, like it doesn't really okay <laughs> and i i promise i promise 30 seconds I, i'm i'm a leader of a branch of the of the industrial workers of the world i don't talk about it a lot online i do talk about the iww all the time i'm the branch secretary treasurer of my particular branch i love my branch with everything within me everyone on this stream who has been involved with this german revolution knows the reason why last re the last stream i wasn't able to be here is because we had an iww emergency when you have a wobbly emergency it's my heart and soul and the reason why i am able to construct from all of these like like disparate left-wing elements, and I absolutely mean it. We have people who are into Sterner and anarchism. We have people who, like, say, the reason why I'm here is because I'm a Marxist. Like, <laughs> we have people who, with, there are these, like, competing and different tendencies that when in real life, there is this humanistic element that has sort of embedded itself within sort of our, to be honest, 
culture as a branch. And I just wanted to say that the experiences that I have had in leadership in terms of organizing a revolutionary trade union is that the way forward, the way like to building revolutionary trade unionism is to say, what are my priorities? What the hell do I need to do right now? And how can I do my best to make people within my branch, in spite of our differences, feel, and I always, I always use these three words, welcomed, loved, and needed. And then using those as opportunities to then begin leveraging critique. It's why I have not in like the in the douchey like edge lord like atheist way, but in like a genuine like you know well mostly because of E. P. Thompson, but as influence, I consider myself a Marxist humanist, like more than anything, because the the construction of people matters in a way, um, and I think that exists outside of the things that they do and the consequences of those things a lot of the time. And that is what it means to sort of reconcile our differences, like with regard to an identity as a working class person and recognizing humanity and others in spite of initial sort of gut reactions, in spite of sort of like strong differences in tendency that like feel irreconcilable because of historical events. But then in all actuality, you know, we're fucking in charge of this. So it's up to us. Yeah. So I'm just going to do my heavy lifting and be kind and good. And then if we got to fight about it, well, we better figure out how to kiss and make up about it, too. So you yeah. Know Anyways, end of speech. Sorry. No, that's fine. This but is I'm... great. So, uh, Axel, if you have to go soon, I want to give yes, you. Yes, exactly. I wanted to say uh, yeah. goodbye. I have, all right. I have to go. It was very nice, uh, very interesting conversations, and uh, I'm glad to have been part of it, and uh, good luck with uh, with the rest of it. And uh, just for the folks who are uh, who maybe haven't didn't hear your introduction, uh, where can they find your work uh, online? Uh, online, uh, you you can find it in bookstores, of course, and sure, uh, and in libraries. Uh, we'll link your books. Think- yeah, I think um, I think um, German scholar no loyal subversion is available online. If you Google it, I think there's an online version available. Well, uh, thank you so, so much. It, it's uh, it was a real sure. pleasure to have you, and we hope that uh, you can come back sometime soon. Uh, we'll be doing we'll be doing the whole book. So uh, if you ever want to come back, you are always welcome on our stream. And we'll just Absolutely. do your book. Yeah, we'll do your book good. next. Good, good. <laughs> excellent. excellent. All right. Thank you. Have an okay, excellent bye, evening. Guys. Thank you bye. so much. Bye, Axel. Bye. All right. Bye. So it's just the uh, the four of us left now. Um, so uh, we can kind of keep things uh, going to the uh, greatest uh, extent that, or, excuse me, I can mixing up my words here. Um, we can uh, keep going as long as uh, my co-hosts here uh, would like, uh, but you're certainly, you know, you all are uh, ahead of me on time. So, uh, you know, feel free to uh, take your leave whenever you'd like, but I'm happy to keep facilitating this discussion if it's going interesting places for you. And I want to once again welcome our chat to, um, you know, make comments and questions and we'll try to... Uh, answer them or, or riff off of them in uh, the best ways that we can. So, uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone who has joined us and everyone who is, uh, still, uh, hanging out with us and yeah. So, uh, Rads or Simba or Kyle, you want to keep, keep things rolling. It's up to you. I just wanted to, I just wanted to, I'm sorry, one more time to say that eight thirty is usually about my time. So I'm just, I'm, I'm going to say that y'all are, okay uh fantastic i love this stream hi paul nice to see you by the way um uh but yeah i just i just wanted to say that i gotta jump off um but you can i'm labor kyle on everything if you want to watch my shit i made a video about postmodern theology marxism and final fantasy 10 if you like any of those things (laughs) it's pretty dope i liked it you can follow me on twitch where I make riffs about Bolsonaro getting COVID and stuff. That was legendary. <laughs> oh, thank you. It was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, I, it was a it was a work it was a work it was a passion project. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to just take a second to give a th- special thank you to Kyle for um, covering uh, our sick comrades uh, section in the summary. So thanks for me. Yeah, no, it's uh, helped save, save me some anxiety. So thank you so much for doing that, comrade. And we will see you around. Um, so yeah, all the best. All right. Take care. Bye, Red. Bye, Simba. Nice to see you. All right. Later, Kyle. And, Later, Kyle. Uh, uh, Rads and uh, Simba, do you have uh, more that you would like to say? Um, yeah, I did kind of want to jump off of what um, Kyle was saying, if I may, because I yeah, please, uh, it's completely all you. agree. His, uh, his 90 second, 30 seconds was uh, very spot on. And I feel like I don't want to, to dump on sort of... Uh, online left Twitter or, or bread tube or whatever. I do think that they, prov- they provide like an invaluable service, but I do think the, um, the barriers for, for activity and stuff, you know, functioned very different, differently than they do in, in a, in a meat space in the, in the real world. Um, so where someone might, you know, say the wrong thing or something, and now they're a, uh, revisionist grifter, whatever, um, you know, in, in the real world, if someone had, you know, they, oh, they just recently came out of like the alt right or something and, oh, they really hated Hillary, but they think Bernie might be OK. And they're they're like, oh, hey, I'll totally table your uh, socialist alternative event at this March coming up. You know, am I going to like scroll through their their Twitter to see if they've used any bad words like, oh, no, I mean, we need the we need all the people we can. Yeah, here show up. You know, the table's going to be at this location, show up at this time and we'll give you a big packet of flyers. You know, here's some things you could say, go, <laughs> yeah, know, go contribute. Um, yeah. So. And I just, I'll comment real quick about, uh, in our introduction, um, Rad's mentioned that, um, he did a, a, a video summary of, uh, uh, Frederick Engels, uh, socialism, utopian and scientific. And I actually, uh, I did that with him. So, uh, I think what we're kind of, I think we're all circling back to this, I, uh, um, you know, problem of like, what does it mean to have kind of like, I guess the, the term left unity gets tossed around a lot. And I really don't think that that's a useful term. And I think like, especially doing the readings for this, project has really brought to light which is that like you know unity for unity's sake is uh potentially poison and like you really if you're going to do united actions or be in united organizations with people uh it needs to be on a very concrete basis you know like we are like i think i've even brought this up in the last stream which is you know, if there's something like a big anti-fascist action, like the Klan's coming to town and we're all going to, you know, set aside our silly sectarian differences about, you know, being a Bernie crowd or being an anarchist or an ML or a trot or whatever, we're going to shut up about all that and we're going to get together and we're going to stop these fascists from taking the streets. Like, that's a very concrete you know, unity that people can participate in. That's just an example, right? There's all kinds of other things, you know, like I would love to advocate for something like a mass march for, you know, Medicare for all. That would be great. Um, Like, again, like I'm a revolutionary, but I believe that we can and should be demanding reforms. It's just that I don't necessarily think that, you know, tugging at daddy Bernie Sanders sleeve is going to be the thing that does that. Right. I think we really have to take agency as working people to say, you know, if, even if we are going to take like a, like a reformist or like a reform, like to, to demand a reform, I don't argue is not in and of itself reformist in character, but like to demand a reform from a system that fundamentally does not want to concede them is to, kind of enter into a revolutionary dialectic, if that makes sense, because like the kind of barbarity of the system is exposed when it's like millions of people are marching for this very simple reform. And yet the system is goes, no, shut up, you filthy peasants, you can't have it. You know, uh, I think kind of exposes the uh, contradictions and the the stubbornness and cruelty of, of the ruling class. Right. So that was that's my uh that's my rant (laughs) 
Uh, yeah, Unity for Unity's sake is absolutely bad. Uh, and all of this, all the, like, I mean, how how many splits have there been thus far in, in the book, do you think? So, now? yeah, so I think, I mean, this is just the ones that we know about. So the first one was the USPD splitting off from the SPD, which was over the war, right? The SPD leadership voted for the war credits uh, right. for World War One, and the everyone was like, yo, what the fuck? we're socialists we're against right, right. fighting we're against fighting for the bourgeoisie yeah. like fuck that oh, except so, for Lieb- Liebknecht. he uh, he broke party discipline there yeah so yeah. the uh <laughs> so the uspd the independent social democratic party formed uh out of that split uh after the dissolution of the second international in 1914 and then basically the the spartacus league split again uh or was a kind of a faction within the uspd the kind of the left wing of the uspd the spartacus league was right uh coalesced around you know rosa luxemburg karl liebknecht and a couple of others of the revolutionary camp and then they later split into the kpd uh over basically the sclerotic what they saw as kind of the sclerotic and and you know uh, ossified uh, traditions that the USPD had inherited from the SPD, and mm-hmm. then the KPD splits. Uh, I think in what was it, 1920? Yeah, the 1920, just after the conference, they split again into the K, uh, KPD and the KAPD, the Communist Workers Party, uh, for mm-hmm. basically similar reasons, like not being hardcore enough, I guess. But like, I, I I'm gonna have to reread right. this section, so. Um, yeah, folks in the chat, um, thank you so much for, for, um, you know, keeping your comments coming. Really appreciate, uh, hearing from you guys. This is an important part of this to me is to, um, you know, really involve our audience in, uh, in this conversation because we're not like, you know, professors who are handing down knowledge. We are, ordinary people talking about a really difficult book in a really like impenetrable part of history to understand. So, um, yeah, if you're confused, chances are, uh, we're kind of confused too. And uh, we don't pretend to be experts. So, um, (laughs) just, Mm -hmm. uh, make a note of that. So uh, I'll pass things back to, uh, my co-hosts now. Were either of you guys surprised that the, uh, cap put, Pushed was um like largely nonviolent, like that it started off being bloodless. Either of you guys? Um I mean I think it's it's a testament to the character of kind of uh, how the working class was responding to these things that like the putsch failed so spectacularly because the working class was just like, no, excuse me, fuck that, we're going on strike. And the putschists couldn't even, like, well, you know, the army's not obeying commands, uh, the, the, the Reichswehr, right, they weren't obeying commands, and uh, the workers weren't letting anything move because they were all on strike. So it, I guess like it, is it surprising maybe but at the same time like considering everything that they had been through up to this point how perfidious the social democratic leaders had been and like the fact that um bernie killed rosa <laughs> last <Yep. laughs> that la- happened last time so uh you know uh i think it's uh it is it's some ways surprising that it wasn't way more violent but like at the same time like it's not surprising at all that they were so like on the ball in terms of responding because they were like oh no you don't we see what's going on here and we say fuck that (laughs) that's all i had to say about that yeah yeah for sure um yeah i'm trying to think to what extent it it's surprising i know like you know, for example, the um, Soviet Union was supposed to be this uh, horrible, horrible, repressive police state. But when the Berlin Wall fell and stuff and they had those like 
trials, they found that like, you know, the police had used water cannons or something was like one of the worst things that they'd done. Yeah. Right. Is I guess what's coming to mind. I, I, yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, the other thing is that the Soviet Union at this point is like the great red hope. Like everyone, everyone and their mom who cares about socialism is like, fuck yeah. Soviet Union all the way, you know, like, Right. Despite More or less. The like the so it has huge resonance from. throughout the whole work world of working people. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um I guess because uh, wasn't actually you know what? Now now that you mention it, um how long did it how long uh, long was the period between um the beginning of the putsch? Uh the 15th and uh like the general strike wasn't there like at least a couple of days because it was like literally like a week's long like takeover of the government i think it might have just been a, a few days and like literally all of the like 12 million people in germany uh struck all at the same time so yeah i, I guess yeah. that would be let me grab my mile long calendar off the shelf <laughs> um, so there's a, for folks who don't know, I, uh, there's a, a calendar, like basically like a timeline of the whole revolution and at the end of the book. So I went ahead and printed out the whole damn thing and stapled it together. And it's like, it, it stands end to end. It's like probably like 20 feet long. It's huge. Um, so I'm looking through here and trying to find March 1920. Uh, so March 13th, the cop putsch starts, uh, the strike starts on the next day, uh, on the 17th, uh, cop flees and Leguin calls for the government of workers, parties, and unions. Um, the end of the general strike is on March 22nd. Um, and yeah, by the end of the month, uh, Hermann Müller becomes the, uh, counselor. Chancellor, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I guess uh, the the lesson to learn there is like if you if you just general strike about it, <laughs> the government's gonna have to do something. So all right, guys, uh, general strike for Medicare for all. If Bernie yeah. doesn't win. I think. It's, I, think <laughs> I mean, it's, if Bernie does win, general strike for Medicare for all too. Yeah. But. I mean, I think that's the lesson is that like. I mean, I see folks on, I mean, like, don't get me wrong, I understand why people have that reaction on, like, Twitter or whatever, but it's like, yeah, no, we should be general striking no matter who fucking wins the election. We should general strike if Trump wins. We should general strike if Biden wins. We should definitely fucking general strike if Bernie wins, because that will kind of uh, force him to show his hand and be like, you know, if, if, you know, in my opinion, I don't, I think he's you know, kind of an opportunist, but I think that, the, that those things will, those contradictions will come to a head if there's a general strike and Bernie Sanders is like, well, whoops, got to deploy the military to stop this strike. I think it'll kind of put lie to that, um, you know, illusion. But like, no matter what, like, there's no way that like a general strike would be not what we want to do. It's just like, my assessment is that this country is not like materially organizationally ready for a general strike not whatsoever i think what's more likely is frankly like you know the 2016 we need more class consciousness <laughs> i guess like i think i just I, I don't have like a pessimistic assessment here because i think like the situation is hopeless no certainly i don't and i can't conscionably say that as a revolutionary i think that there's lots of hope in in what where we are it's just that you know there's a lot of dark shit too and we've got to um be sober about this which is you know basically that i think uh if there's you know a period of struggle after um the november elections here i think it's going to look a lot more like um, you know, kind of the months, early month, late months of 2016, early months of 2017, where there were, you know, strikes and well, not strikes, but like riots, basically just kind of here, there and everywhere, because like there really was zero level of mass organization at the time. And I think that like that situation has definitely improved. Like, you know, DSA has grown to like 60,000 people or something. And that's something like that's not i wouldn't even i wouldn't go so far as calling it that, that like a mass party because it certainly isn't but like 
I would definitely say I think that the U.S. left is in like a much stronger organizational um, place than it was four years ago. So like, yeah, that's I guess that's kind of my my quick my very unscientific assessment. But that's kind of just like what what comes to mind for me. So um, I will be right back. I'm just going to refill my tea real quick here. Um, yeah, I think that. Oh, no, go ahead, please. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure folks probably have seen the uh, Innuendo Studios video. Uh, we go, they go low, we go high about sort of, um, you know, Obama, and his sort of capitulation to form versus the, you know, Republicans, which sort of have no use for working within the. the on finds of what they're supposed to do and being real respectable and stuff. And we have that um, no problem here where it's like what Trump was saying that, oh, if Hillary wins, like it's all a scam and he's not going to, you know, go along with it. And he has all of his, you know, not all of his supporters, but I'd say a fair chunk of his supporters that would definitely like follow that narrative and believe that narrative. And then I believe he said something to the effect of, you know, if he loses this next election, you know, is he even going to leave? Is he going to agree with the results? And peacefully leave the White House um, where, you know, maybe uh, maybe Bernie needs to start saying that kind of shit. You know, I mean, he has definitely more uh, uh, facts and, and stuff, you know, on his side, more, you know, material reality behind his uh, positions than than Trump does. But, you know, it's like if he loses, he's just going to take it peacefully, um, which is maybe too bad. You get what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, I kind of get what you're saying. Um, I think that I think that Bernie is too nice to both Trump and Biden personally, um, and it kind of sounds like you agree with me at least a little bit here. Yeah. Yes. No, maybe. yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, like, he's. Uh, I don't know. I mean, hopefully, I'm glad that people are actually here watching this instead of the debate. Uh, yep. <laughs> any number of people. But but yeah, I mean like, um, Bernie. Bernie really does need to stress uh, the fact that like, Biden is just like like, a dude with all kinds of like horrible shit that you don't even have to dig up. It's just like public knowledge. Um, oh, you're you're cutting out. I think. Oh, uh, hello. Uh, uh, oh, yep. You sound hello? fine now. Hey, like. Yeah, it's like Biden's terrible record and like uh, the fact that he can't string a fucking sentence together. <laughs> like, yeah. just a little. Like, I'm sorry. How does anybody like I, I, this? I just keep coming back to and saying this, which is how the fuck is anyone voting for this asshole? Like, it's not just his, like, creepy misogyny and shit. It's, like, his the segregationism, the fucking, like, just, it's, like, I, like you said, it's all out in the fucking open. And, and the fact that he's just, like, you know, going on weird grandpa rambles at the end, you know, you can't hold a fucking sentence together, and they're not, you know, like... Yeah, I don't want to get into yeah, it, Bernie, but like, you Bernie know what I'm definitely be more mean, but yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, it's like, um, going, going back to the innuendo studios video, it's like the Republicans the whole time were calling Obama the obstructionist. And then as soon as the Republicans are in power, well, the Democrats can't turn around and be obstructionist because then they'd be called, you know, hypocrites or whatever. So, you know, looking platform is to do you know, as worse, as bad as they can, what they don't want to be happening back to them. And so same goes with like this whole narrative that Bernie's a bully and he's just too aggressive and he yells and his mm -hmm. fans on Twitter are never so toxic or whatever. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, they're, they're so preempting any ability to, uh, you know, um, attack. I mean, it's like a, it's like a debate tactic. Like, um, <laughs> for some reason this is what came to mind but in that the movie eight mile and the uh, the eminem character comes up and he starts his uh thing by dissing himself to take all the fire away from the other person's ability to diss him <laughs> um that that like 
you know, oh, Bernie yells and he's too aggressive and he's too mean. Well, now what is he supposed – he can't say like get up there and say, hey, by the way, Obama picked Biden because he was like basically a Republican and it was going to calm down the moderates that this like, you know, outspoken, more left-leaning president had this like Republican with a D next to his name as the vice. Yeah. Uh, and I- and just railroad him on that and railroad him on the segregation stuff and railroad him on the war on drugs stuff. Um, but it's yeah. not going to ha- happen. I am once again asking you to cyberbully people on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that's my best. That's my best Bernie. I can't do a very good New York accent. But I mean, you did better than I could. But y'all know you you y'all knew the joke I was making, so I'm not crying about it. Yeah. <laughs> um. So uh, I want to respect everyone's time here. So are uh, are you all um doing okay for time? And I don't want to keep you guys here way longer than you had wanted to. So. Uh, as of now, I'm completely fine. Cool, Rads. How about you? Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm doing fine. I mean the. I think we've been going for two hours, it looks like. Two hours and 25 minutes. That includes the time that we spent um, talking with Axel before uh, the stream started. So a little under, t- let's call it two hours and 15 minutes. Okay. Sure. I I think that, like, uh, you know, if, if we if we dive into something else and end up making, like, a lot of points on it, uh, then that's fine. But we maybe even can kind of think of... Get, getting towards closing remarks or something, I guess. Yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Um, I think that's actually fine. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess we could maybe just uh, wrap up with uh, maybe kind of looking to the future on, uh, let me pull up uh, the uh, PDF so that we can um, have a look-see at, let's see. Chris Harma, and there it is, German Revolution. Open. Everyone can see this, so. Um, looking forward to next time. Uh, we're going to be doing chapters 19, uh, 20, 21, and 22. So, uh, this is talking about uh, if we can, we can see here, zoom in a little bit on these, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, but we just finished chapter 18, the cop push. So next time we'll be talking about, uh, chapters 19 through 22, uh, starting with, uh, the communist party at crossroads, uh, Moscow and the German revolutionaries, uh, the great hopes of 1920, and Paul Le- Levy, uh, a German conception of communism. So um, those are the things that we're going to be talking about um, two weeks out from today. Um, so folks in the chat, if um, thanks for tuning in and listening. Um, uh, you guys are great. Um, we really appreciate everyone who takes time out of their busy, busy lives to come and learn with us. Uh if you need a copy of the book, if you want to follow along with us, uh, you can message myself, uh, Kyle, Simba, or Izzy on Twitter, and we will get you a, a PDF of the book. Um, if you want to order a hard copy of it, um, you can get it from Haymarket Books directly. I think it ho- costs about $35, which is really reasonable for um what this book is it's absolutely massive and a really critical piece of um socialist history so um yeah if you want to follow along with us uh you can grab yourself a copy of the hard the paperback or you can get a pdf from one of us um and i guess i'll just wrap up by saying that i think we had a really great discussion today i'm really glad that oxel agreed to come on with us um was really indispensable to have somebody who not only like specializes in German history on with us to talk about these things, but also um, like he's written extensively about it and uh, has, you know, absolutely 
encyclopedic knowledge about the German Revolution. And uh, once again, he uh, is one of the co-editors of the uh, co- the latest editions from Verso Books of the uh, collected works of uh, Rosa Luxemburg. So uh, that's uh, more about uh, one of our... Yeah, yeah that uh, one sounds really cool. Yeah, so um, once again, I will remind everyone that if you felt lost today, that's okay. We we were pretty lost too. Uh, this is not a this is not an easy book to digest, and this is not an easy period of history to understand. There's a million things happening at a million miles an hour, uh, so we will be um, you know breaking continue to break things down in future streams and continuing to kind of refine our ideas and coming to a you know, a, a better assessment of, of both this book and making sense of what uh, what the German Revolution means for us, uh, especially in the countries of the imperial core in today's uh, late stage capitalism and decline, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I also kind of wanted to pose a question for next time, which is that um, some so-called third worldist thinkers and others have kind of made this critique that like because of things like what happened during the German Revolution or the failure of the German Revolution and like the influence of things like the labor aristocracy in these uh, colonial or imperialist countries that basically the proletariat is too bought off and too bourgeoisified to really be able to meaningfully have a proletarian position in the world system and hence like their interests are too bound up with um the continuance of of uh bourgeois society uh to be a revolutionary agent now that's not an endorsement of that critique that's just me kind of laying out the 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 basics of it uh I yeah, th- this idea. I'm the, sorry. The I'll... idea, right, that like a uh, uh, Vietnam and Cuba and stuff can work, but like Germany and uh, the French Revolution and stuff couldn't, right? Yeah, kind of. And I mean, like, I I am engaging in a bit of caricature here, but I'm I feel like I'm also trying to be charitable um, with my interpretation of what uh, kind of third worldist or related perspectives that I've heard from others. I don't, I mean, like, I, I think that they have, there's some, there's definitely something to that. Like, yeah, the pro there is a significant layer of, uh, you know, nominally working class people in the Imperial core who I think will never side with, um, you know, the global proletariat against capitalism. And I think we need to square with that, um, in our, you know, struggle right that's part of what we're trying to those are one of the contradictions that we need to work out is these you know elements of things like settler colonialism and imperialism that are really central to what's happening in today's like capitalist collapsing hell world right like these are these are absolutely crises of settler colonialism and, and imperialism as much as they are crises of you know capitalism all into itself, right? So that's kind of I guess questions that I wanted to weave into our overall um, uh, arc. I guess this is not just necessarily like just questions for next time or just questions that came up during this specific stream. But like, I think these are questions that are going to continue to have uh, pertinent um, dis- points of discussion as we go forward, uh, not just in this discussion of the German Revolution, but as we continue to kind of uh, engage in struggle in the here and now. So that's, uh, I guess, the kind of last thing that I wanted to say. Uh, I'll guess uh, Simba and Rads, if you each want to take you know, a couple minutes to kind of wrap things up for yourselves and put out any last points that you wanted to make, and then we'll uh, call it a night. Okie doke. Um, I think, uh, unless you wanted to go first, Rads. No, please. Sure. All right. Um, Yeah, I think I could be wrong about this, but part of the um, third world's position is that, like, at an earlier time in history... Uh, 
it was possible to have a uh, revolution in like uh, an economically advanced country, but because of the advances in the international state apparatuses, stuff like the IMF, uh, you know, the World Bank and stuff like like because of those apparatuses and international military interventions, like it's no longer possible. Uh, I think that that was some part of the third world world is position. Mm-hmm. Um, in any case, uh, yeah, I think that um, a few of the big takeaways here uh, from, from this section of the book are general strike about anything and everything. There's never a wrong time to general strike as long as you have like an idea of what to strike about. Hell yeah. <laughs> I, I think we can all pretty much agree with that one. Um, splits can be both good and bad. Uh, I think that unity for unity's sake has uh, proven to historically not not play out well. Not that I'm not even sure that we've seen unity for unity's sake uh, at a point in history, but definitely good and bad splits um, with within the the book. Uh, and also that history is hard. And I, I think at some point, radical reviewer, you um, said something about like, oh, maybe I'm not familiar with the names, but here's what I got from it. Like, dude. I've been reading this whole thing, like, up until this point. I don't know half the names. Yeah, <laughs> we are we are all yeah. very much on the same page there. I think yeah. probably the only person of the five of us who have been on this stream today, I think Oxel was probably the only one who knew all the names, and I think probably he would have a hard time keeping them all straight if you asked him on the spot. So, yeah, right. don't don't stress about that. And like he said, there's that glossary of names at the end of the book which i actually like printed out and put in its own little um three ring binder and it's definitely helpful but it's still kind of dizzying even with that Mm -hmm. as a study aid it's very very difficult and like i want to kind of remind not just everyone on stream but everyone listening too which is that like if you're studying revolutionary history it's easy to get a headache and you should not stress out. Don't think of yourself as not being smart enough or whatever. Like these are things, these things are hard to understand even for very clever people. So, you know, this is why we do these study groups is to kind of break these things down, turn them into more digestible uh, content for everyone to uh, kind of think through along with us. And this is why I really encourage folks to get a copy of the book, either from, you know, again, I'll say that you can uh, message one of us on Twitter and we'll give you the PDF or you can order it from Haymarket. Um, you know, please try to follow along with us. because I, I guarantee you will get more out of our stream. Um, you know, I realize not everyone has time to sit down and read these things, but uh, I think you will get a lot out of it. So uh, Rads, if you want to make your uh, closing remarks, uh, we can wrap this puppy up. Pun intended. Puppy up. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, so so one thing that I that I thought of uh, when when Kyle was giving his first two chapters is I was thinking I want to say it was uh, Alan Johnston who wrote uh, the forest and the trees. He was talking about when he's teaching his college uh, students. There's like this big political protest or something that took place at the college, and he would teach it to them, and they were all there and knew about it and stuff. And then a few years later, he would teach it to the students and they knew about it because their older sibling went to the college or their parent went to the college. And so they knew about it from them. But eventually, you know, as history, you know, progressed, he would be teaching about this political event that happened at the college. And he'd be like the only one that the students had heard about it from. Um, and I'm reminded of, um, this, uh, Milan Kundra quote, I think I've used in videos before, uh, the struggle of man against, Power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. Uh, the struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. That um, it's really important to kind of have even just a cursory understanding of, let's say, the German Revolution, for example, because it is uh, just beneficial for power for us to forget these histories you know if um the wto protests can kind of fade from memory for some reason the radical movements of the 60s kind of stuck you know maybe they've been co-opted enough into like our popular historical understanding that they can stick but wto protest you know the occupy movement let's just let that fade from memory the iraq war protests that were like some of the biggest global anti-war protests in 
you know, ever in history. Let's just let those fade from from memory. Um, and, you know, we only do uh, ourselves a great disservice, I guess, to not understand uh, what, you know, the histories of people who, who struggled um, in struggles that are similar to ours with goals similar to ours and to look at what what happened, um, where they succeeded and where they might have stumbled. Um, I think that it's uh, incredibly important. And that is that is what I have to say on the matter. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, no, that's an excellent contribution. So, um, yeah, I thank you, Simba and Rads, for coming and, and doing with uh, this with us. As I said, we're going to be uh, the regular four, four of us, the four amigos, the four comrades, uh, myself, Simba, uh, Izzy, and Kyle will be back uh, two weeks from today at the same time. Uh, 3 p.m. Uh, uh, Pacific, six or 3:30 p.m. Uh, Pacific, uh, 6:30 p.m. Eastern time uh, to talk more about this. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks again, everyone, and uh, we will see you uh, in two weeks. Bye, everyone. Thanks, thanks for joining thanks. us. Bye. <laughs>